global literature and cultural confluence across diverse media has been awarded the Ottawa Award 2021. Under his direction, Siegel Books has published more than 500 books by major European, Latin American, African, and Asian writers, including the works by the Nobel Prize winners. Pragya Tiwari is a journalist who has written extensively on politics, identity, policy, and culture, and has edited several publications, including Telka, The Big Indian Picture, The Vice. She currently works as a policy and culture, cultural consultant and is also the creative director of Ojo Media and co-founder of the Indian History Collective. So now I welcome Naveen Kishore and Pragyativari on stage for the session, Publishing Without Borders, Siegel at 40. Yeah, I think there's an AV which is to be played. Please do that. Yeah. So, Pragya, over to you for the session after the AV. Thank you very much. And uh, one of the things I find for Naveen is that if it's been done before, I won't do it. If you can't. What is his angle? He's a force of nature. It's a style and it is an entirely theatrical style. The part less travel. But found his way and shared it with others. Ek visit me, it's not lava impact for the kissy publisher ka, kissy publishing house ke daftar ka, ye mene kabi essence. If one talks about quality publishers, one has to put them right up on top of the list. वो एक हिस्ट्री का लेक्चर होता है और उस लेक्चर के बाद किनारे which really is the story of world literature. You know, I regard myself as a reasonably well-read person who takes an interest in reviews. I do read the book review and the London review and the New York review and so on. At least I look at them. And yet this was a body of literature that was new to me. They were all writers of absolutely top quality. And I thought, my goodness, this is another world. And I found it an intellectually very exciting world. Poetry, prose, prose poetry, literary criticism, thought, philosophy. And so one started looking at the books much more carefully and ordering them. And then later on, delighting in the fact when Naveen said, well, if there's something you really like, just let me know and I'll send it. <laughs> He decided that, okay, um, at midnight on whatever the date was, uh, was when Seagull was born. And on midnight of several days, he did the whole production. So we all had to sort of like stir out of bed and brush our teeth and put on our clothes and go so that on the dot of midnight, we were watching this amazing performance. What fun. I mean, why not? You know, it comes from from a world where we understand what the immersive experience needs to be to suck somebody in. His catalogs are theatrical. So Nandani's designs are theatrical. 
uh, the very nature of publishing something that's so exclusive and such a collective item is theatrical. Every single Seagull book, each book has its place in the world. You know, it needed to be there, it should have been there, or even if nobody thought it needed to be there, once it was there, you recognize that it should be there. So one question he's asked in every interview is, what is your business model? And he says, it's, it is the funniest question I'm asked. Because actually, he says, I don't have an answer for it. I've never seen him talk about a book as a business. That book is going to do well for me. This is the one that's going to keep us going, etc. So you are certainly liberated from the kind of considerations that normally drive publishers. You get the plan first, you get the vision, this is what I want to do, the rest is just logistics. And that attitude is what is uh, key to why he keeps going in a way when a lot of other people can't. So, you know, wow, what is this? Is this a prakashak? Is this a prakashak? And in Delhi, I went to a prakashak in Delhi, so I went to a prakashak in Delhi, so I went to वहां किताबें छपनी है और वहां से किताबों को जाना है पर वो कभी ऐसा नहीं लगा कि वो किताबों का घर है एक फर्क हुआ मुझे लगा यहां किताबें रहती हैं सीगल Thank you very much for that film. For those of you um, who don't know, this is part of a documentary that's being filmed on Siegel in its 40th year. And I'd like to obviously begin by thanking um, Jaipur Literature Festival for uh, having us. And uh, it's a delight to be back here after two whole years of a hiatus that felt like a century. It's exciting. But more than that, I am um, very, very thankful that I was chosen to do this session. I've been speaking at JLF for over six, seven years, and you know it's been lovely, but this one's truly special. And I'll take a minute to tell you why. I must have been um, you know, about six or seven years old, perhaps, um, or somewhere there about when I first went to Seagull. I grew up in Calcutta. And it used to be a sort of monthly ritual, twice a week, month or once a month, my father would take me to this South Indian restaurant called Raj in Calcutta. And thereafter, we'd go and spend hours at Seagull. He'd browse, he'd chat with the people who kept the bookstore. Back then, I remember as a kid, Naveen coming over to my place. But of course, he wouldn't give me the time of the day. I was merely a kid. And then I was 16 and I left for London. And while I was at London, I somehow got... Um, involved with the world of theater in Bombay and then was commissioned quite regularly to write for the Seagull uh, Theater Quarterly, the STQ. And uh, that was sort of uh, a second coming of Seagull into my life. And then in my 30s again, uh, when I lived in Delhi as a journalist, Naveen and me reconnected and I am um, grateful uh, to call him and I'm delighted and proud to call him a friend. And I say this, because um, not only is he a great friend for reasons that, uh, you know, uh, will take too long to enumerate, but also because I am so, so proud of what Siegel does. I am not just, I don't just have respect for it. I have gratitude for it. Uh, there's so much that that bookstore and that publishing house has brought into our lives and into my life in particular that um, words fail me. So thanking JLF, and Naveen for speaking to me. I'm Thank going you. to start. Um, and I'm going to start with the name Seagull. Um, when one thinks of Seagull, one thinks of birds by the sea, one thinks of Shekhar's play. But that's not what the publishing house was named after, was it, Naveen? Would you like to tell us about a certain slang that uh, Seagull is also stands for? Sure. So very briefly, uh, before Seagull books began, I had a different, you know, before I reincarnated myself as Seagull books and a publisher, I used to be a theater lighting designer and what you call event managers these days. And the first thing we ever produced with a dear friend of mine, Shubit Roy, uh, who was very much a mentor who taught me lighting, uh, was a rock concert um, called Seagull Empire. And when we got the first poster design, 
it said Great Bear, which was the name of the group. Great Bear live at Kalamandir, is how most people would read live at Kalamandir. So I said in my little, you know, rookie voice, I said, um, there's an opening song called Seagull Empire. Why don't we call it Seagull Empire, the Great Bear live at Kalamandir? So that's how the name came. And Seagull Empire song was all about living all alone in my Seagull Empire, that kind of stuff. But Seagull is American slang for cocaine. So it was that kind of a rock concert. Um, so Jonathan Livingston Seagull, owes, you know, we owe them an apology. That's how, and then 12 years later when the books happened, you were so much a part of a certain community within the cultural space that you just said, Seagull books. So that makes complete sense. But um, let's stay at the beginning. Let's stay at the beginning of the books. So you're this young theatre guy in Calcutta. You're doing all sorts of things in theatre. You're a lighting designer. Um, what makes you get up and say, I want to start a publishing house? I mean, from what I know, the little I know, the idea was to find a space for books on theatre, books on the arts. But take us through that moment in time as you remember it? And what were the early publications? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it goes back to, you know, I said, I talked about event management. So I used to be involved with uh, deaf theater. There was something called the Oral School for Deaf Children. And they had a lovely theater group. And the, uh, you know, the woman who was a trained actor and mime and director, in fact, Zareen Chaudhry, she was, um, she even taught at the Pune Film Institute, the, the batch that had Naveen Nischel and actors like that, taught the mime. She used to do this deaf theater thing. And I was involved because I was totally in adoration and in love with her. And uh, so I used to produce and design these things. And then one day she came back from a US tour where she saw the National Theater of the Deaf, which is a wonderful sign language and deaf combination of actors. And she said, I wish we could break them down. And that set me off like a, the Holy Grail for 13 months. I went about bringing these nine actors down. I found free tickets from the Americans and I found one wonderful Sardar gentleman at the uh, Indian Airlines who said, don't mention us on the brochure. Here's nine tickets for Delhi. It became an emotional experience. Wonderful Parsi friends putting them up somewhere. People at Taj putting them up. You know, it was like a whole emotional experience. After that, to go back to surviving off bedroom farces and barefoot in the park didn't make sense. So I turned to a mentoring person called Shamik Banerjee, who was later to become our founding editor. And he said that if you want something meaningful, there is a wonderful theater activity in a 40 kilometer radius of Calcutta. They never come to the city. They go further into Bengal's lesser known villages. They perform a certain humanitarian theater as against a flag waving political one, using their bodies in the famous Grotowski tradition of poor theater why don't we bring them and do a kind of grassroots theater festival? So I said, okay, logistics idea. So we got them. And I remember it was at La Martine Hall. It was like, this. we just wanted a round space with some benches. And during the performance, that moment of publishing, that, that birth happened when I saw through the silhouetted bodies, one person drawing feverishly the body movements of these actors. And I said to Shamikda, I said, what a pity, this is also ephemeral. I wish there was a way to document. He says, ah, boy publishing, got to start your, you know, all the big publishing houses have 400 mouths to feed. You need a specialist niche publisher who will focus on theater, cinema, fine art. I said, hey, we have a name already, Seagull Books, let's do it. And literally, I had no idea where the money was coming from or, there was no sense of not knowing how, you know, how, how is the knowledge going to be gathered? I just assumed that, you know, you would work your way through it. And that, that was the actual moment, June 20th, 82. What I left out was that we actually retired from the performance to the open air bar at the Astor Hotel and 
over Bloody Mary is this idea was born. As do all good ideas. So you start off, you know, as a niche publishing house um, to document what is usually the ephemeral in your own oh, You words. wanted the first books. Sorry. Yes. So, where, so we decided theater and we turned, literally, you have to remember, we were surrounded by all these wonderful people who'd never been really published except in their own languages. So you turned to Badal Sarkar and he said, yes, yes, of course, translate it. And then we turned to a man called Ashit Pal, who used to design for me, and he had been researching the woodcut prints of 19th century Calcutta. That became another book. At that point, I didn't know how many to print. I printed 10,000 in 1983, and we still have 500 in print. So now they've become wonderful limited editions, but I had no clue that I should print less, you know? I just thought it will sell. We wanted a film script because that was the time when the new Indian cinema and Ray Benegals and and as often happens in uh, the Indian, you know, the cinema world, it's always Ray Sen. So we tripped up to Shatajit Ray's house, which was always a kind of open thing. And we told him about our plans with great excitement. And he hummed and hawed in his wonderful voice. And he said, uh, I, it's lovely, but I, I want to see how this shapes up. So we trooped down, etc., and went next door to Minal Sen, who said, take it. So it was a whole personality difference, right? So the first script was In Search of Famine. And at that point, I was traveling Richard Schechner, who was the guru of performance studies, and he was traveling. He had coined something called environmental theater, which means if you're doing Mother Courage in this hall, all of the audience is sitting on slotted angle, you know, like a mechano set, a giant mechano set. And the performance is happening in the middle so that the final scene with Mother Courage pulling the wagon, is police connecting the audience platforms, and it's as if she's pulling it all. It's all wonderful. So I was the stage manager and designer for all of that. So we turned to him, and he said, I have a book on the Ram Leela. So you had a theoretical one. So one theoretical one signaling you want to do drama theory, play scripts in translation. The screenplay was interesting. Somebody like Ray would normally write beautifully like a Bergman, but Minal Sen, his screenplays would change almost 60% on the floor, depending on your energy as an actor, whereas Ray would be doing his wash drawings and stuff. So Shomik came up with this wonderful thing called post-production scripts, where you viewed every shot of the film on those old editing machines called Moviola and described the film shot by shot. It was pre-video, this thing. So that was the first four books. They're still in print, by the way. All of them are, in fact, that woodcut book, if you don't have it, I suggest you grab it. But um, so here you are, you started this niche publishing house, which is what it intends to be at that point in time, there's Siegel Foundation of uh, the Arts that comes there after yes. much later. Um, you have a wonderful board by then. Um, and all of this is within the realm of the arts, the focus is still on the arts, mm -hmm. you are thinking through the role of theater in society. Um, I'd be happy if you spoke about it a little bit more, but then I also want to kind of jump to 2005, right? What happens in 2005 that makes you say that this is no longer a niche thing that I want to do, and you um, start, you know, a, a, a London sort of uh, a chapter for Siegel Books? What is the status quo that you wanted to challenge? You want the actual story? Or I want the, the absolute actual story because I know it, so you better tell the truth. Are you guys all here in confidence? Nobody leaves this room without. <laughs> okay, so my friend Jayant and Gulen Kripalani were going to be posted in New York with Jayant as a kind of accompanying spouse. And he said to me, I want to do something. What am I going to do in New York? I said, you know, Seagull New York, Seagull London, should we? Yeah. So he got very excited with the idea. And so I said, yeah, we, you know, this is what it takes. This is how we do it. Our money's as good as everybody else's. And, you know, we've been told by the American West that, hey, you guys publish for your own subcontinent or your own country. We will cherry pick your Satyajit Rays and Binal Sens for the rest of the world and do it as our books. So I said, why? We do such wonderful books. I, you know, it's the courteous thing is to get distribution. Now, 
This also shows how we work, which is I got excited with the idea. He got terrified of the idea. And so he started to do other things in New York. And I started Seagull Books London Limited, where, oh yes, there was one interim thing where I sent off a round robin letter. It wasn't quite round robin because I didn't have the same text to Gayatri Spivak, Richard Schechner, Tarek Ali, Arjuna Padurai, and Colin Robinson, friends, some of them you would know, to say, what do you think of this idea? And before I knew it, the most amazing articulation, something I hadn't thought of, the empire strikes back to genuinely thought out that, you know, you're changing the status quo, this is wonderful, that you can do it. So I thought I had a good thing going. The only brief we set ourselves was, no architectural realities, no spending money on offices, just a registered tax paying entity, Seagull Books London Limited, not a branch of Seagull Books Private Limited in Calcutta, that's the legal structure. And um, that was it. And of course, we had to figure out what is it that we're trying to do. Then I made a conscious decision because then the political thing started to play in my head and the possibility of this thing happened. And parallelly, when I was growing up, in fact, even when you were growing up, different generations, but there was, a, there was already at my time, books beginning to disappear, translated literature. So by the time 2005 happened, it was not the flavor of the month it's become now with wonderful presses all over doing translations in the world. So I turned to translations. I turned to Europe because as a young person, European literature was available here. And it was always a literature of hope for me. In my darkest moments, I turned to even darker literature from German or French translation. And you know, it was like flipping the Bible, only it was literature, well, literature both. So, I, and it was 100 years of Jean-Paul Sartre. So I walked in with a French photographer friend who spoke English to Gallimard's office. And I, there was a legendary um, rights officer called Anne Solange, who said, I'm too busy, meet Florence Giry, one of assistant. Florence and I went on to do 22 books in four years because she trusted me. The first questions were a bit daunting, like, why are you publishing Sartre and Debord and Ardpo for Calcutta? I said, no, 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 I'm distributed by the University of Chicago Press, da, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. When the first books came out, you went to the same translators who were used to translating Sartre or Adorno or Ceylon Bachman letters, they, they kind of got confident. But my knowledge stopped at the dead ones because that's what I'd read. I didn't know what you were writing as a young person, a writer. So I did something which I'm told now was very radical. For me, it was the normal thing to do. I sought help by writing letters to translators and saying, hey guys, don't you have a wish list? What should I do next? And there was silence first and then a flood because nobody asks translators. They pitch, they beg, they plead, they send proposals and you're supposed to figure out what you want. But to me, it was a natural thing to do because they were close to the ground with all these wonderful writers. I didn't know these languages. I had a kind of intuition. So people often ask me, hey, you don't know German, French, Italian. I don't have any answers. We've, we've, we've done over 500 books in 15 years and there's four other gone wrong in the sense we felt, all of us, why did we do this? Which is not bad. So it was a circle of trust. You started to trust translators. And then the other European publishers got the act of figured out this is the kind of salad bar to offer you. And yes, of course you tested, you got samples done occasionally, you got advice, but it's, if you ask me for method, it's retrospective. So I want to stay with this. I want to stay with translations for a second because if there are two things that come to mind when one says Siegel, one is translations, the other is transnationalism. I want to stay with translations. You talked about how you approach translators and how you sort of um, trusted them and then you started and that built a circle of trust and all of that. Um, you make it sound easy. It couldn't have been easy. I want you to talk a little bit more about the conundrums, the challenges of taking on translations in so many different languages and also the importance. I know, uh, you know, you, you tend to be, you, you're inclined to be very, very humble, but you need to tell us a little bit about the importance of the work that Siegel has done 
when it comes to translations, because that's quite a legacy by now. Okay, so the first bit of the question, if I may be allowed to deviate into a little anecdote about failure, right? So typically what happens is that either I look at the book, where do I first get the, you know, what is your first interaction with that possibility of that buying of rights from say a German publisher? It would be at a Frankfurt book fair, it would be a catalog of rights, which would have 250 words, not always well written, giving you the synopsis of what the book is about and the background of the author. And so your first honing in was the instinct. Could be anything. Could be you like the name when the summer came, the rain came, the deliver, whatever. You've also chosen like that, unfortunately. But after that first instinct, when you followed it up, you maybe requested a sample for a chapter with a translator. You appointed a translator in discussion with the author or the publisher, all of that kind of stuff would happen. Now, all this is fine and then eight months later or 12 months later when it came and it worked for you and your three colleagues, you said, wow, we chose well. But sometimes in your excitement, you, two things, two very short stories. One was a political one where a philosopher I will not name at this moment, and you will allow me that, um, French, I grew up reading, saluting, loving, all of that. Suddenly two of his books appeared available, conversations with him. So a translator, Chris Turner and I got excited and we bought at X thousand euros the right to publish this. He translated the first one. And suddenly I got a letter from Tariq Ali and Benedict Anderson, dear friends and authors, who said, you can't be publishing this guy. I said, why? Look at this, look at this, look at this. And I got a barrage of links of articles of his current pronouncements, which was so Islamophobic. There was no way. So you picked up the phone. You sent the translation back to the publisher. You lost your 4,000 euros or whatever was involved. You had to offer to delicately talk to the author, which they didn't mercifully except this, I don't know, we'll handle it. I told them the truth. I said, it is a political issue. We can't possibly do this. So that was one kind of thing, right? Where my lack of the language led to all of this and you pay the price for it. We paid the translator, we gave it from our own blessings, et cetera, et cetera. The second thing was at Frankfurt, a dear translator in the early days, Katie Derbyshire, I think she was, yeah. She, walked in with great excitement and said, you have to publish, you have to get me this book. Some 28 year old Swiss German writer called Dorothy L. Meiger. And I said, who is the publisher? She said, Dumont in Cologne. I said, oh, they're the next appointment. So uh, Judith Habermas, the great Habermas' daughter is the rights manager, she comes. Before she begins her pitch, I say, hey, I want this book. She says, don't do this to me. I'm supposed to sell it to you. I said, well, Katie wants it. Next thing you know, you do this book. It comes out wonderfully. All of this happens. Four years later, Dorothy writes a second book. So what would you do? You go to Katie. So you go to Katie. She translates it. And the author hates it. I love the translator. I love the author. Translator loves author. But you have a fully paid for man translation, which hasn't worked. So you get back and say, will you guys sort it out? And she says, but no, I think that in English it has to be like this, like this. She says, I don't mind that, but I don't have any punctuations and you punctuate it to make it simple for the reader. So I sided with that. So we paid off the translator. We did three samples after that, all paid, all rejected. Then the author found a translator. Meanwhile, I've read five translations and they were absolutely superb that the final one that she chose and I could see that. And there's countless such stories, but this also happens just to tell you that it's not all. It always sounds easy in the thing because, you know, after it's happened, it is easy. I uh, was going to come to this later, but because you brought uh, this anecdote up of um, returning, um, you know, of, of letting go of a sum of money uh, after you'd signed an author on because of their political views. Naveen, for you, publishing has always been sort of underpin your approach has always been through your values, through your value system, through your um, belief systems, your political ideas. Um, and that's increasingly rare. I mean, it was always rare 
when it comes to publishing. There are notable exceptions, of course, but uh, by and large, that's rare. And now it's in increasingly rare. Um, I, I don't know if any, many of you know this, but Naveen also sort of at some point got rid of certain clauses that um, shackle authors with um, having to fight sort of libel and, and those sorts of cases, uh, sedition cases, and, and you know the onus is on them and not the publisher. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, I mean, it's remarkable, it's something that deserves rounds of applause, but I also wanna ask you what that sort of cost you, what that journey has been like, and what, what how do those values serve you today and in, uh, in a very uh, unprecedented political climate? Well, it's first of all been the intuitive thing to do, which is what is right or what is wrong. You know, we started the Siegel School of Publishing and here's a gentleman sitting up front who's wonderful country, Norway supported it, made it possible. And um, one of the sessions that I do beyond, it's called Beyond the Contract. And what it teaches our young is that you, two people, and Avi should get into this conversation, when they're doing a contract, there's just that much you can foresee. If you're Oxford, you of letterpress, you foresaw the ebook. So if our contract was based on that, as our earlier ones were, we have ebook rights in a different thing. But if you were Seagull, you couldn't foresee, you didn't have the patience to sort of foresee. So when you had, for example, your um, author suddenly getting a Nobel, and you have a contract from 20 years before, which gives you the right for all languages. He gets the Nobel, you're at Frankfurt. Every single country in the world wants to publish a 20,000 worth in the translation. You sell 32 rights at 132,000 euros. It was an intuitive act of, hey, things would have been different if I had contracted you today. So I sent 50% to him. All right. Now, they sound very romantic and goody goody, et cetera, but it's just, a lot of people like me practice this. They, they just do it because it just seems right to practice a certain ethics, including in the art world. We're often, you buy something at 1200, you sell it for 22 lakhs. For you, obviously it's your property, but it's nice to be able to do this percentage sharing differently because eventually money is a conduit, right? And everybody uses it to do something great. It's not, to me, it's a common pot. It's very important. My relationship with money is all about, it's there, it's, it's, it's a kind of, uh, anybody can use it, you know, as long as you get things in the arts done. That sort of thing, I don't know if that totally answers your question. But. No, it does. Um, but the question I'm, I'm, uh, that follows naturally from here is, tell me what has made um, Seagull stay alive, thrive and Stay ticking, okay? Stay. Because this is, I, I have no idea. I mean, I, I feel like I know Seagull. For 40 odd years, mm. when publishers with deep pockets are struggling, are shutting <clears throat> down, you are a man who has uh, stuck to his guns in terms of the kind of books you want to publish, your ideas, your values. And not only are you alive and kicking at 40, you're going from strength to strength. You have a roster of authors. Uh, that is absolutely fabulous and not just because they've won nobels or bookers or you know it's just an, an incredible collection of authors tell me what goes into the secret sauce well this is a very difficult question only because i very, very genuinely don't really know how it functions which is here's what happens when in 2005 we decided to set up the seagull london thing Obviously, you would assume vast sums of money are needed. Not vast, but sums of money are needed. Now, it was also the first year that we had got out of the red. So we would have been very happy as publishers. Our backlist was our strength. The problem with most publishing today is it's all front list oriented, right? So we do Jane Fonda and Pragya Tiwari and we sell 60,000 on animal rights and whatever. But will you take your great-grandchildren to a bookstore and say, I want this book 
of Arnold Schwarzenegger's gun law or something or the other. No, but the front list brings them immediate gratification. But you would take them for a very strong backlist, and it's across the backlist that your cash flow happens. We have over 900 books, they're all in print. So the two, three, four, five, six copies. The second thing is you don't create a morgue out of your archive. Archives have to be living things. You have to reinvent your authors. Even when they've become Dodo Land, like Mahashata, you start doing your graphic novels. You now start doing your audio books. You bring out a paperback. You mix and match. You break up the three stories and breast stories and bring them out as Stanadani or Choli Ke Piche. Or you keep reinventing. This is not rocket science. European publishers, European publishers have always done it. Before the advent of literary agents, the rights manager's duty was this. Before the rights managers, publishers did it. So I am a kind of practicing publisher who believes in that. Certain books are constantly being printed and reprinted. The Mahashwatas are a treasure trove of cash flow. Play scripts I did then, Habib Tanbir, Ghasi Ramko, these are selling in the 10,000s because they're texts. People said, why are you publishing this? I said, I don't know, it needs to be documented. The fact that they were, it wasn't strategy, I couldn't foresee anything. 30 years later, they became texts. So it's that kind of cash flow. Two, you're always in debt. Well, luckily, the last five years, we're not in debt, but which is wonderful in the pandemic. We also sometimes reinvent for other nations. For example, and this is a concrete example, which is that, let's say that we have a German list of 162 titles. The Germans give me something called the Goethe Medal in 2013, appreciating. In my head, the books are actually a minuscule part of what I've done with Germany because my relationship goes back to 72 when I did theater with them and jazz and dance and you know, all kinds of stuff. So it's like a lifetime thing. So the man who pins it on me, suddenly one day in 2018, it strikes me, I need to find some money. So I write to him, he's in Munich, he's the president of Goethe and I say, when you come to Frankfurt this year, instead of inviting me to your party, come and have a coffee at the stall. I want to reinvent the 162 books, a hundred of these into the German paperback library with the series design book. And I need 4,000 euros per book because translation has been paid for. It's going to cost twice as much and I will meet you 50% of the way. And it reinvents that entire thing. No one's ever done it. So he comes, he meets, and for four years, you have a cash flow that starts with 100,000 euros. I'm saying there are ways, genuinely, but you don't know the ways as strategy. They come, they, you unveil as you go along, however silly it may sound, as a business model. Um, you sell art. So I used to show art. Why? Because you came into my life, you painted. I said, let's show it. I'm an event manager. I hire a space, I do it. You then go on to become a blue chip, that I end up handling your estate. So to me, it's not a personal asset. There is no personal in business, right? I could be earning X lakhs of rupees, lecturing at whatever, Jindal or Ashoka, but I may be having the independent publishing house that's floundering, but I will not mix the two, right? But here, everything, your watch, your shirt, everything's on hock. So you sell things off your wall and you survive because you have to keep lots of people alive during the pandemic, for example, during the cyclones, right? You, within your circle of affection, you look after as well. You can't, you're not a government. So you can't do their job for it, but you do what you can, people you touch. Sorry, I'm carrying on, go ahead. No, and uh, in case anyone was wondering that uh, the artist he was referring to was KG Subramaniam, my time is almost up. Um, I am going to ask one last question and then open it up to the audience. You talked about keeping your archives alive. Um, your bookstore is also an integral part of your publishing house and it's always been a living space. The older space was a living space, the current space is a living space. Uh, and the other thing that uh, it would be amiss of me not to talk about is the design element when it comes to Siegel. We've all been told, don't judge a book by its cover, but I cannot tell you how many Siegel books I have bought because of the cover, and I am um, happier for it. So quickly, if you could touch upon these two things. Yeah, 22 years ago, a young person called Shonandini Banerjee walked into our uh, offices and uh, was employed at some 
I don't know, 2,000 rupees to proofread or assist into it. Within a month and a half that it took her to figure out the Apple computer, uh, she was mucking about with typeface. She could never draw. I noticed her doing the strange things on design. And I was about to do a jazz concert with Pam Crane and Anjum Katyal called Blue Moon. So I said, why don't you design the tickets and the poster? And she did a great job. And uh, she just kept designing after that because I noticed that she had a sensibility that was far superior to mine where I was actually typesetting my own books designing my covers, I taught myself to do all of this. Again, I couldn't draw, but she was like streets ahead because of her own reading and so on and so forth. And next thing you know, when Anjum left, she stepped into the chief editor thing. She also started to teach everybody else to set. So all editors set books inside. They teach type how to breathe on pages, not the congested claustrophobic things. Um, so Shalandri is an integral part also of what we call, people often ask me now that I'm 342 years old as to, you're going to be dead tomorrow, what's gonna to happen next? And she doesn't, they ask her and she doesn't blink an eyelid, she just carries on with it. She only falters at the end when she says, you know, I still have to figure out his relationship with money. A word about the bookstore and then we take questions. Sorry? Book a word about the bookstore and then we take questions. Yeah, the bookstores, they, well, it's now a kind of independent space for only our books. It's, a, you know, we, we decided, we used to be a bookstore that imported every single university press in the world, it became a dead trap. There weren't any takers, the dollar was shooting up. So we have this wonderful space where, you know, before the pandemic, it was a live active place for, uh, and you extend the bookstore. You don't always insist on holding your events there. If something needs a larger space, you move, you know. I moved an entire bookstore once when Gopal Gandhi launched his um, um, Gandhi and Bengal book to the G.D. Bidla Theatre Foyer where we set up a 3,000 square foot bookstore with all the shelves and just to, and all of the shelves are full of 2,000 copies of one book, so. I wish it was more of a traveling adda. With that, I'll open it up. Uh, is, are there any questions that anyone in the audience has? Anyone? Well, I'd be very glad if you don't have questions because I have plenty more, but I will give you another minute. Yes, of course. Hi, sir. Um, I'm from Connected to India, and we're actually a Singapore-based online media platform. Um, during the pandemic, we saw that the performing arts sector was hit hard. And uh, you, in fact, have been used to sort of chronicling performing arts and uh, the theater for decades now. So I just wanted to ask you about the synergy you see and how this uh, symbiotic relationship of uh, so, uh, with performing arts get now because of the pandemic getting used to performing in front of a camera and rather than a live studio audience and Seagull already with decades of experience in uh, chronicling theater and other performing arts uh, se sectors how do you see this synergy evolving in the future even if we are no longer forced by the pandemic to uh, restrict lives events so you know there were two phases of the kind of documentation from what i can make out one was when for about 12 years we were doing something called the seagull theater quarterly which died an unfortunate uh, not quite natural death and we'd regret it but uh, you know it exists as a free downloadable archive um, the other documentation was the fact that we never lost sight of the fact that we started as theater publishers in translated literature and so on and so forth. So you did, except for a five year period when I deliberately, quote unquote, neglected what I call the India list, because I was too busy playing first world publisher to build a synergy of books to which we could then ride piggyback on with this. But theater, documentation shifted to the world. So we were doing Palestinian stuff and we were doing Syrian theater, and Japanese, all of that. So continuing to document in the only way I can because I'm no longer involved directly with performance as such, right? Uh, 
So that continues very strongly. We have a very strong list called enactments, which is theoretical performance studies. We have in performance, which is plays of every political who and you know you could think of. But your question, I thought, would have a different sense for me, which was that you were talking about the problems faced by live performances in the pandemic. I mean, were you sort of? My uh, question exactly was that during the pandemic, they were forced into a new model. Uh, the going performing online, arts sector, yes. Yeah. Going I online. am not a, I mean, I accepted that, like one accepts realities, technology changing, all of that. So I think a lot of them put it to good use. I am personally, as Naveen Kishore, not a great fan or advocate of the, uh, see, when you do, to do it for your survival, I can understand. But there were two kinds of people going online. There were the ones who were trying to survive and turn it into some kind of a module, right? Why the JLF is a survival story to these two very difficult years. He makes it look very easy. But there were lots of people on the bandwagon who were just doing it so much of a hurry. And I kept saying, take a, you, you need to pause a little. You need to find the balance. You don't just switch and then not go back into the first opportunity you have of in performance. Okay. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Did you have a question? So my question was, doesn't translation necessarily kill the spirit of the book? Doesn't translation necessarily kill the spirit of the book? Kill the spirit of the book? Yeah, for example, I would say procrastination in English, but in Hindi, I would say Mujhe Alas Aratha, which doesn't necessarily make the same effect on the reader's mind. This is a tricky one in the sense that, I mean, there are many schools of thought here. One, of course, is would lead to absolutely no translations happening if one went into the fact that a lot of us have grown up on translated literature in a certain kind of way. I would agree that there's always something that may be lost. But if you are good at what you do and you don't just translate for the sake of, you know, you, if you decide that I'm going to translate five different voices in the same perfectly correct grammatical English, then Mahashwata and Tony Morrison and, you know, uh, whatever can sound the same. You, you need different registers. So the translator's job, which is often thankless, is a very difficult one. They have to find in the language that they are translating into similar resonances, which means the author has to also have enough trust and generosity to allow that. If you sit there and work, which I do closely, I'm facing that problem. I have a, a book out, which is getting translated into Hindi and Bengali and Marathi and Malayalam and so on. And it's driving me up the wall because I'm saying, yeah, just do it. Great freedom, take liberties. But very few of them are taking liberties. They want to keep getting back to the... So it's an interesting process. Um, I'm carrying on like this because I don't have a short answer for you. Well, speaking of uh, long answers and uh, longer questions, our time is up, I've been told. The book that Naveen is referring to is called Knotted Grief. I hear <clears throat> that it's a very good book. And he will be talking uh, on the 14th to Ranjit about the book so uh, please attend that session and uh, thank you for listening to us and here's looking forward to the next 40 years of Siegel. Thank you Naveen. Thank you Prakya. Thank you so much. So we would like to thank Naveen Kashur and Pragya Tiwari for the session. Thank you. <laughs>